Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of My Ruby Story. This week, we're talking to Daniel Pritchett. Daniel, do you want to say hello? Hello, how you doing? Doing all right. How about you? Not bad at all. Glad to be here. This episode is sponsored by Sentry.io. Recently, I came across a great tool for tracking and monitoring problems in my apps. Then I asked them if they wanted to sponsor the show and allow me to share my experience with you. Sentry provides a terrific interface for keeping track of what's going on with my app. It also tracks releases so I can tell if what I deployed makes things better or worse. They give full stack traces and as much information as possible about the situation when the error occurred to help you track down the errors. Plus, one thing I love, you can customize the context provided by Sentry. So, if you're looking for specific information about the request, you can provide it. It automatically scrubs passwords and secure information, and you can customize the scrubbing as well. Finally, it has a user feedback system built in that you can use to get information from your users. Oh, and I also love that they support open source to the point where they actually open source Sentry if you want to self-host it. Use the code devchat at sentry.io to get two months free on Sentry's small plan. That's code devchat at sentry.io. Um, now, do you want to just remind everybody who you are? We had you on to talk about chatbots. Mm-hmm. Sure. Back um, in episode 422. Yeah, I remember that, and thanks for having me on. So my name's Daniel. I live in Florida. been a Ruby developer since maybe 2010 or so. I started out working on it at a hackathon, trying to get a cool project done. It was a little much for me to pick up rails in that weekend, but I did get the project done. Uh, by 2012 or so, I'd done a couple of Ruby one-offs with Sinatra at work to help out with my uh, Windows reporting admin job. And then around 2012, I transitioned into a full-time Rails developer job and never really looked back. Did professional Rails dev work for about six years. And then uh, sometime two, three years ago, I decided to write a book on chatbots because I was really into chatbots and used Ruby to build the code for the book because I was much more comfortable with Ruby gems and RSpec and all the stuff I wanted to include to make sure the book made sense to readers. So that really st uh, held me in good stead. Currently, I'm an infrastructure engineer, which doesn't always mean Ruby all day, every day, but it's still near and dear to my heart. And I managed to find ways to use it for my personal projects and one-off scripts and occasionally in the course of the day job too. Good deal. So uh, yeah, in on this uh, podcast, we talk a little bit more about you as a person, a little bit less about Ruby as a technology. Okay, um, and w one thing that I'm curious about, and this is something that I've kind of added to the interview since I started this show is what do you like? What do you like to do? I mean, besides code or whatever you do for work, you know, you're talking about infrastructure engineering, which sounds like uh, sort of DevOps and maybe a few other things mixed into that. Yeah, um, yeah. If you're not working, what are you doing? When I'm not working, uh, so as I said, we just moved to Florida. I'm really enjoying the weather, uh, meeting new people, finding excuses to get out of the house because I work from home. The things I've been enjoying the most lately, uh, number one is going to be going to a local Brazilian jiu-jitsu gym. I've got a nephew and a brother-in-law and now my daughter are all uh, at the same gym and we like to go and learn and wrestle and sweat and laugh and just have a good time. So that's definitely my biggest hobby right now outside of work. Uh, aside from that, I've got two dogs that are just tons of fun and bundles of energy that I have to keep up with around the house and the yard and the neighborhood. This last week was lucky enough to go catch some crabs off a dock near our house. And, uh, oh, nice. Yeah, that was super fun. We've got a little dip basket. We just put in some bait and lean it down a few feet below the water and wait for the crabs to crawl in and take them home and eat. So just settling into Florida life lately, uh, the book was really my biggest uh, after hours activity for a couple of years there. And after wrapping that up back middle of this year, I've been sort of slowly allowing myself to spread out into more leisure time and socialization and things. Haven't really felt the need to get back into side jobs or side projects much. Just having that time back to do stuff with the family or explore my new community has all been great. Cool. Now you've, you've mentioned the family, so you're married, you have kids. Yeah. Uh, I married, man, how long has it been? I married back in 2004 when, uh, 
I was a senior in college, I think. Uh huh. And uh, or maybe I was a my first year of grad school. But anyway, my residential boarding school way back in the late nineties when we were teenagers, and we got married about five years later, and now we have the one kid, a twelve-year-old daughter, who is just riding the bus for the first time here in seventh grade in her new public school in Florida here. Cool. Very cool. Yeah. So you, you've been married just a little longer than I have. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, we're, we got married in 05. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. I noticed I grew up, I grew up in the South, uh, born in Alabama, lived there about 25 years, another 15 in Memphis, Tennessee, and now here in Florida that uh, people growing outside of the larger urban areas tend to marry younger. And then when I lived in Memphis for 15 years, most of the folks I hung out with were not likely to get married before 30, if at all. So that was always funny. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, cool. Well, let's let's dive in and talk a little bit about your uh, programming journey. Sure, sure. Um, when I was in uh, elementary school, we had some DOS computers at the house. And uh, I learned a bit about managing the system resources with the config sys file and the auto exec batch file just to manage... Uh, games that used a lot of resources. Uh, didn't really program at that age beyond really simple basic programs like 10 print hello world, 20 beep, 30 go to 10. Right. Uh, <laughs> the yeah. Good old days. It was, it was pretty fun. And, uh, you know, just enough to uh, occasionally get me in trouble at school. People don't always like it when you spin up dumb programs like that. And I guess that's been a, uh, a constant theme. The types of programs I make tend to be more tend to be a sorcerer's apprentice sort of situation where I'm just trying to see what I can do. And every once in a while people be like, well, I really wish you hadn't done that. So I guess I have a long history of doing that. Uh, yeah. In in my earlier teens, I did a little bit of dabbling with Visual Basic, but didn't really take. Uh, in high school, I think I was a junior at the boarding school I mentioned earlier. I had a roommate named Jesse who had learned Delphi and uh, Pascal from his or with his dad, I guess. His dad was a professional programmer. So Jesse knew how to program, and we were both into just Windows, sysadmin stuff. We started downloading Linux when we got uh, T1 in our dorms. It's the second half of our junior year. So we're playing around with Linux and such, and we wound up taking a C programming class together. So I learned basic C and C++ from the classic uh, K&R book. It's at uh, Kernigan and Ritchie, the pretty small white book with the C on the cover. And... Uh, that was interesting. I remember specifically the teacher gave us a pretty, uh, pretty forgiving approach. Like he teaches something for a week and then he give us an assignment. Uh, the assignments didn't always force me to learn the things I was supposed to be learning that week. So I distinctly remember writing some programs that did things the hard way. Like say, maybe I was supposed to be learning how arrays worked, but instead I would just make a bunch of variables like that sort of classic, uh, learning experience. And for whatever reason, I guess he just checked the compiled output more than the, the content. So that was, that was really an interesting experience. I learned a lot more about how the computer was working because before I kind of only could infer based on doing sysadmin work in Windows and Linux. Eventually, I ended up in college as a management information system student. At some point, I think I started as a computer science student just because it seemed like a good idea. I did a couple of uh, years of that, learned the basics of data structures and programming with Visual C++ and uh, Java, that didn't really work out for me. I just wasn't enjoying it at that level. So I switched to a more business-oriented program called Management Information Systems. Wound up staying in college for maybe six or seven years, got the MIS degree, and then went back to get a, immediately back to get a master's in computer science. So by that time, I had a few years of academic experience with uh, Visual C++, which I never really liked. Something about the uh, the write code, compile code, run it and see if it works and try again cycle never really appealed to me for years. <laughs> um, it just takes a long time. And I am very much into rapid iterations and experimentation and instant gratification when it comes to programming and exploration. So honestly, even though I wound up getting a master's degree, I never really felt like a confident, comfortable programmer until a few years out of grad school. I'd learned a little bit about PHP and some other things along the way. But at some point, mid-20s, I think, I was working a job where I was building reports, click and drag, uh, drag and drop type things for enterprise reporting purposes. And 
I had heard a lot about Python in the past few years. Like I remember it really interested me that the game Civilization 3 supposedly used Python as a scripting language for some of its higher level uh, game logic, not for the low level game engine, but it was right. neat. That was the first time I'd heard of embedded scripting as a, a thing inside of a otherwise high performance system. So that made me interested. I think there was an XKCD comic right around that time, the import anti-gravity comic were just suggesting that programming in uh, Python gives you all kinds of superpowers without too much effort. So sometime around then I decided I wanted to learn Python and I read the book, uh, Learn Python the Hard Way by Zed Shaw. Oh yeah, Zed yeah. Shaw, it's, he's, he's an a, interesting fellow. Yeah, he's definitely a character. Uh, <laughs> I've never met him, but uh, you know, I keep up with him from time to time and he creates a lot of interesting stuff, but I could imagine that he's not always the easiest person to be in close proximity to. He has strong opinions, but I guess we all do. So that book really worked for me. The style of typing out the lessons one at a time and running the stuff and seeing it work just really worked. And I started doing things like trying to implement web scrapers or maybe open up a browser, just do really simple stuff with uh, the Windows build of Python 2. Point whatever it was back then. And uh, at that point, I, that was really the first time I started to feel like I was able to write arbitrarily complex or useful programs, just have an idea and figure out a way to make it happen. Uh, my experience before that in school with Java or C++, I never really felt like I fully understood the basics of file IO or network IO or program structure modularity at a pragmatic level. I mean, I'd learned a lot of that stuff in classes and I'd passed the classes. So I could, I could tell you, say what's a disk driver and why does it need to exist? But it wasn't really until I started working in Python and then shortly after that Ruby, because I was very interested in rails just based on all the cool press coming out about the, the rails blog demo back in the late two thousands. Yep. So yeah, from there, I think a few years passed where I learned more and more about Python using flask and learn more of the same with uh, Ruby and Sinatra and, uh, Rails on the side. I kept messing with the Michael Hartle Rails book, which has got to be at least 10 years old by now. But yep. it, really, it was cool. It had a good, its approach to building an entire project where you have unit tests and uh, you learn how to use Git and probably deploy to Heroku and a bunch of other stuff, like actually having a functioning application pretty early on in the process really resonated with me. And that kind of informed the way I like to teach people how to program now myself. It's a uh, because I went through all those years, better part of a decade, learning theoretical programming and actually writing very small programs for school and getting grades on them. But it wasn't until I got to a language with a REPL and a very big standard library, which Ruby and Python have a lot in common. They're both built on top of the same operating system level libraries, right? So it wasn't until I got there that I really felt like I could just program anything and never really looked back from there. And now I really do write all kinds of goofy programs to automate little things for myself or for my job or family or whatever's needed. Cool. A few years ago at a JavaScript conference, I was approached by Nader Dabit. And you might know him from the React Native Radio podcast. He's also a developer evangelist for Amazon. And when he came to me, we had a conversation about React Native. And the thing that I love about React Native is that it's approachable, it's web technology, and it's cross-platform. And it makes a lot of things really easy for developers to jump in and do interesting things on mobile with JavaScript. So we've had this show now running for several years, React Native Radio, where we interview people about the React Native ecosystem, some of the things that are coming out in React and how they affect mobile, and other options that you have for mobile development. So if you're doing mobile development, you're doing it in JavaScript, you're looking for a good option, or maybe you're just trying to stay current with React Native, then go check out React Native Radio at reactnativeradio.com. So who introduced you to Ruby? Was it just the overall, I guess, hype cycle that, that brought you into it? Or a bit. was there someone uh, in particular that said, hey, this is a thing, check it out? So back in the mid, late 2000s, I was reading a lot of tech blogs like Coding Horror and such, and mm -hmm. eventually got into reading Hacker News, and there's a lot of interest in the startup space in rapid prototyping, which is obviously a specialty for Ruby and Rails. A couple of other formative experiences I remember there were, uh, 
I did a hackathon locally back in 2008 and got together with a couple of other people. We were going to make some sort of uh, online gaming company. It was, I guess the idea was sort of like Zynga, making mm-hmm. Farmville and things back then. And I was really the only programmer per se on the team from what I remember. And I was surprised to find that I did not have the capability to really had together a working demo or prototype in a weekend. Uh, I think in retrospect, I, may, I was making it harder for myself than I needed to because I did have enough PHP skill that I could, probably could have pulled it off. But even then, I was thinking, oh man, this would be great to do with Rails, but I didn't have any kind of Rails experience. I did see other people there at the hackathon crank out a really nice uh, Rails app that weekend, and they were using VirtualBox to build it and host it in a Linux machine. Right. But that was cool, and that was very inspiring for me. I was like, man, I want to be able to do that in a day or a week or a weekend and not have to spend a month reading this book to learn it because, heck, I've already got two degrees in the field and been a professional in the field for a few years, and I still can't write a simple program in a weekend. What did I miss? So getting into Ruby really helped me further flex and stretch those muscles over and over again to where I really felt like I was able to do whatever I needed to. Another formative experience around the same time, my old roommate, Jesse, who uh, I mentioned, I learned to program with him and from him. He actually mentored me a bit when I was an undergraduate. Uh, he lived with me for a while and I was taking you know, C++ classes and he'd help me figure out things when I got stuck in my homework. But anyway, so pretty early on, Jesse moved off to the Northwest and uh, worked for Puppet when it was a very young company. Mm-hmm. And before it became such a well-known, widely adopted tool, he pretty, Jesse identified early on that Puppet was cool and it might become something impressive. And uh, he made some open source contributions and talked his way into a job with them. So uh, I that's just watching him and his career take off in a different direction from where mine was going in a big enterprise reporting and a Fortune 100 company made me progressively more interested in learning about Ruby. But honestly, there was just so much hype about it back then around 2008, 2009 time period that it was definitely on my radar. Those are just two experiences. I remember thinking, wow, he's got a cool job doing cool stuff and seeing the people at the hackathon crank out a respectable demo on a weekend was the other major thing that got me wanting to do it besides just reading blogs and watching videos about how cool it was. Makes sense. So uh, what made you decide to uh, stick with the infrastructure per, or yeah, infrastructure stuff instead of moving over to programming? Hmm. So I spent six years or so working for consulting development agencies as a full stack rails programmer. My first real programming job after I stopped doing enterprise reporting was a full stack rails job where I'd build online stores and stuff. Uh, those projects tended to be from a month to six months. Mm -hmm. And right then in 2012, we were doing most of our deployments to Heroku and uh, a tool called Worker was uh, newly available for Heroku then where we could write, we were writing our test suites in RSpec and we could hook up Worker to our Heroku apps and it would run a test suite and automatically deploy it to a staging server. And then I'd show the stage and build to the client and say, hey, I built that feature we talked about last week check it out at this URL. If you like it, let me know. And if you liked it, I'd go and click the deploy button and work would ship it straight to production. So that got me a really tight and uh, reliable feedback cycle, which I mentioned earlier, I like tight feedback cycles, right? So first I like the REPL or PRY, I guess, is my favorite Ruby REPL, but I love doing that with my own programming. And then having the same available for actual iterative development was great for me. I've been into extreme programming for since at least that long, right? So working through a series of progressively larger agencies, uh, I kind of got away from that smooth uh, click a button and ship it to Heroku option. I worked on more and more things that were hosted on Linode or DigitalOcean or Mm -hmm. VMs that we'd have to manage. So suddenly things like Puppet or Chef come into play or Ansible and I'm having to do Linux sysadmin stuff and I'm less and less able to convince people that the whiz bang, just push to get and have it deploy approach if Heroku is appropriate everywhere. So that got me more and more into the Linux sysadmin stuff. And because I like speed and reliability, I learned more about Linux in general, about networking. Uh, and because I was so into build and deployment, I wound up getting more and more into 
build scripts and deploy scripts, learn stuff about NPM scripting, about rsync, and just the whole bunch of supplemental stuff. And I realized that on my in those agencies, on my teams, where I'd have a bunch of developers who were nominally all doing the same job, full stack development, that I was always first to volunteer to do something like take a five minute test suite and spend some time trying to get it down to one minute or set up the build and deploy and the test harness for this new project. Like that was always where I wanted to be. Uh, I like the idea that if I'm on a team with five or 10 developers that I can make this one change or set up this one project here and it'll have a lot of impact and the rest of the team can all benefit from that for weeks or months or years to come. And so that feeling of leverage that, uh, infrastructure and DevOps work gives me is, is what's kept me coming back in that area. So after about six years as a full stack app dev, I started to realize I'd really be more interested in doing infrastructure and DevOps type stuff. And the agency where I worked at the time wasn't quite big enough to support full-time focus on that. So I started looking around for other work and found my first real full-time official infrastructure first job instead of uh, one that was primarily app dev with a little sideline and in sysadmin work. Makes sense. So you make this transition and then uh, what kinds of things have you been doing on that end of things? Are you mostly then setting up like CI CD pipelines or are you doing chef or Ansible or puppet uh, deploys or Kubernetes or yeah. So yeah, definitely a bit of everything. The one thing that surprised me the most, uh, is I don't really feel that I have much in the way of the classic school of uh, configuration management in the way we used to use Chef or Puppet or Ansible. I've got Packer creating uh, machine images for Amazon. So our hosts, as they spin up, have our basic set of tools installed on them. And then uh, AWS has, we have Cloud Init and a few other tools that'll run some boot time scripts to do the last mile of configuration. But between that and uh, the cloud formation and Terraform stuff that we have to manage a broader scale of resources, like say creating or configuring a load balance or setting up or configuring a database and all of that. Uh, yeah, somehow between Packer and Terraform and cloud formation, I no longer feel like I need something like Chef or Ansible in the same way. And I guess that kind of reminds me of uh, the way the the rise of Node.js sort of took chunks out of uh Rails in that for a while, Rails was really the most effective uh, all-in-one solution for a really broad swath of uh, programming needs. Like if you want to do something here and you want to do it well, then Ruby's a good choice. But as Node got more and more popular, a lot of the things that people were depending on Rails for now had more competition. And there's still a very solid niche where Rails is still a great choice for specific things, but there's stuff that maybe Rails would have been a no-brainer choice for in 2010 that a lot of people might do in rail, in a node right now. And I kind of feel the same way about what I'm seeing with uh, Terraform, for instance, is between Terraform and uh, Packer and just a few shell scripts and make files at the margins. I'm no longer feeling that I need the uh, same types of tools we used to manage uh, the more long-lived VMs in the past. And maybe it's a mm-hmm. pets versus cattle thing. Like that's a really common discussion, especially in DevOps is uh you know, you want your servers to be something you can spin up quickly from a automated config script and be able to throw them away just as quickly so that they're, you're always confident that you have the right config checked in and you're not dependent on things that aren't documented or maybe bit rot. So I do feel like it probably isn't necessary to, I wouldn't say that Ansible or Chef or even Puppet are older tools from a different time that really are more closer to the pets end of the spectrum than cattle. But now that I'm dealing with machine images and actually spinning up and tearing down a dozen virtual machines here and there with cloud formation operating at the uh, AWS API layer, that there's a lot less work happening from the time the VM first turns on to the time we're actually using it. So there's just less of a need for me anyway, to deal with tools that had that much management of a long running Uh, VM. Cool. One of my favorite communities to get involved with these days is the Angular community. There are so many great people there. We've had a lot of them on Adventures in Angular over the last several years. And 
I really wanted to just highlight people and give you a chance to get to know the flavor and the feel of being around some of these awesome people. We've talked to people on the Angular Core team. We've talked to people who have organized the conferences. We've talked to some of the co-hosts that I've had on Adventures in Angular. Nowadays, Aaron Frost is running the show and he's doing the same thing. Typically, he's been doing it at conferences lately, which is a lot of fun. But you get to hear what these people are about and why they care and how they get involved with other people in the Angular community. So if you're looking for that connection in the Angular community and a way to really understand the people who are involved in the Angular community, then go check out My Angular Story. You can find it at myangularstory.com. So what are you working on these days? Do you have any um, new projects in the works? It sounds like you've kind of slowed that down a little. A bit, yeah. I don't have too much going on on the side in terms of uh, my own hobby programs. Uh, I do have a pretty good variety of stuff happening at work. Like the infrastructure setup is obviously a key part of what I'm doing in terms of managing the AWS resources for the company. But also, yeah, we use uh, Circle CI for our build and deployment tooling. So there's always things to be done in terms of, say, speeding up this Java build by parallelizing this or caching that or deleting that. And uh, I'm learning more about continuous delivery. Like conceptually, I'm cool with it, but going from I have these hundreds of lines of make and bash that deploy my thing to I really love my instant uh, super reliable deploy pipeline is still an ongoing journey for me. I do actually do a bit of application development and tool building at work. So I've done things with Python primarily, but I did build a chatbot using Lita, the framework I focused my book on. So that's been a fun thing, sort of transitioning from app dev to infrastructure dev. I find I have a lot more of a tool and application building mindset than some of the other career sysadmin types. So it's good to be able to bring that to the table. But yeah, in terms of uh, what I'm programming in my spare time and outside of work, it's really more about probing the types of tools and uh, hosting solutions I expect to need in the next few years. So been messing with Terraform and Kubernetes for a couple of years now and using progressively more of both of those. Terraform, just use it all the time at work now. Kubernetes we use a bit, but I imagine it's going to be more and more of what we need. I've been using uh, AWS Lambda for hosting serverless applications for a couple of years, but for what I do, that hasn't really progressed beyond a marginal use. Like I have put a few things out there with Lambdas and they do work, but I don't feel like they're making a huge difference to me. So we'll see if that doesn't become more of a thing for me or not. As far as what I'm doing with Ruby lately, uh, it's really become my go-to glue language. Like if you ever... Uh, Keep up with uh, Peter Cooper on Twitter, mm -hmm. the Cooper Press guy who posts a bunch of newsletters. Uh, he will occasionally talk about the scripts that he uses to speed up his process, like maybe do some data analysis or some communications automation for himself. And I now have a couple dozen shell scripts on my machine that automate things that I do regularly. And I just check them into a little private Git repo. And a good third of those are written in Ruby because once something gets beyond a few lines of bash, I usually wind up screwing it up enough to where I get frustrated. And I think, you know, I may as well just do it in Ruby where I know what I'm doing and I can scale it up arbitrarily large as needed. But I do have a very modular focus. So even those things never get too big. Cool. Well, if people want to check out your book or see what you're working on these days, where do they go? Um, so uh, I have a blog at dpritchett.net. I don't update it too often, but it does have a landing page that points to my book. I think it's just dpritchett.net slash book. And uh, Twitter is probably still the best place to keep up with what I'm thinking about and exploring from uh, week to week. And that's just at dpritchett on Twitter. There's definitely a good bit of uh, keeping up with Rubyists from my past and the Ruby community in general. But my overall technical focus is certainly more on enabling and empowering teams using whatever tools I can make work than it is about figuring out ways to use Ruby for absolutely everything the, man, mm -hmm. the way I might have done it five years ago. Cool. Well, let's go ahead and do some picks. Do you have some things you want to shout out about on the show? Oh, man. Uh, let's see. What am I into picking lately? I've been having a pretty good time uh, using diagramming flowcharting tools to uh, map out some really big designs that I've been thinking through. And it's not just design so much as figuring out a holistic perspective around our company's uh, infrastructure needs and like what are the things we get stuck on now and then if we have a dozen developers doing this and that who gets stuck here what do they need like say we have a problem deploying this thing quickly and easily because we don't have the 
we don't have a particular tool for us or we don't have uh, we haven't built enough competency as a team in a specific new technique we're trying out. I'm finding that keeping a map for myself uh, really helps to maintain that context because there's just so many different facets to what we're into. And uh, let me see if I can find the chart. Oh, yeah. The tooling I've been using is called Lucid Chart. Uh, it integrates with Google Docs. You can you have to pay a small fee to keep a monthly account, but being able to go from, I have 10 different pet issues of things that I know would be major benefits to us as an organization to, to here's my chart that keeps up with the hundred different things that we can see as potential areas to improve or strategic opportunities for the near future, or maybe just uh, things that we know are specifically going to enable us to get something done that we need to have done next quarter having a spreadsheet or not having a spreadsheet, a flow chart like that really helps me to keep that perspective, but also to show people when someone says, Hey, I'd like to get this done. And I got to say, that's a great idea. I'd like to be able to help you. And here is like where it fits in the big picture context of what we're trying to get done. It's really been a useful communications tool for me. Cool. Um, I'm going to throw in a few picks of my own. Um, one of them is, uh, so I've been training for a marathon marathon nice. in about six weeks. And, um, my coach told me that I ought to start um, fueling while I'm running, which just essentially just means that I eat something periodically. Okay. Um, and I've been doing the keto diet. So, you know, usually they have like gels and stuff that are full of sugar. But if you're doing keto, then sugar is a no-no. So right. um, I went and talked to some of my friends and um, there were two things that came up. One was... Uh, the F bomb or super fat, uh, nut butters. And so usually it's like macadamia nut butter or something like that. And, uh, anyway, they, they're, they're really good. Um, I, I took one on the run that I did on Saturday, which was like 12 miles. And, uh, yeah, that worked out really, really well. So That's I've been, I've been cool. pretty happy about it. Um, and then he, one of my friends recommended, um, olive oil and it turns out that in the U S you can call it extra virgin olive oil and still cut it with other kinds of oils, uh -huh. which I didn't realize, but I lived in Italy for two years and yeah, I came back and extra virgin olive oil here just wasn't as good. And I just figured that it just wasn't as good. I didn't realize that they were mm -hmm. cutting in other oils to make it cheaper. And so, um, he gave me a, uh, um, uh, a link to where he gets his, and I guess they import it directly from, um, from Italy and uh, it's hundred percent pure. So that's very cool. Anyway. So I'm going to put a link to that in the show notes as well. But uh, yeah. So um, you're talking about your, your marathon training reminded me, I mentioned briefly at the top of the hour that uh, I've been enjoying jujitsu lately and I could definitely plug that in general. Um, any kind of a uh, grappling type sport, seems like a really good fit because for me, I work from home. I'm alone most of the day. It's a very sedentary job. Like I keep a stand up desk and I've got exciting dogs, but I'm still not exactly getting a ton of exercise in my first work from home job. I got lonely to the point where I'd get excited about going to the grocery store, getting a haircut because I could see people and talk to them and we could smile at each mm -hmm. other. And maybe somebody would shake my hand or touch my hair or something. It's weird to think that you're just missing on that basic human contact. But, uh, and you know, I have a wife and a kid, but so there might be the only people I see for a week if I don't go out of my way, go out of my way to meet more people. So going to jujitsu a few times a week has just been a perfect antidote to that because for an hour I'm working out hard, I'm sweating, I'm having fun, learning things. It's it's a pretty technical, uh, strategic sport, and you know I'm touching people, but like in a, an appropriate way. You know we're wrestling and squeezing each other and cranking each other's arms and feet around, and it's just the exact opposite of sitting around in a, a room by myself with a computer all day. So just a few hours of that really refreshes me in a way that other athletic things I've tried in the past don't like, I used to really love powerlifting or jogging and those are both fun, but the way I did them, they were both pretty solitary, which mm -hmm. didn't quite check all the same boxes. Like it's good to take care of yourself physically and it's doubly important if you're a programmer because your job's not doing you any favors there, but adding the extra dimension of, camaraderie and laughing and touching other people in uh, a grappling situation has just been great. And I particularly like that the fact that it is a grappling art because I'm not super into the idea of uh, punching people who are getting punched on a daily basis. Like 
not really looking to have concussions or give people bloody noses or vice versa. And this is so far feels very safe and enjoyable. So it's a, it's a good, it's a good thing to check out that there's, you can do Greco-Roman wrestling and there's other kinds of things people could check out if they have similar interests. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. For me, I get the social from, I go and play Dungeons and Dragons with some friends of mine and things like that. So, but nice. yeah, definitely need that uh, interpersonal interaction because yeah, I work from home here too. And I get some of it talking on the podcast, but it's just not quite the same as being in the same room as people. And yeah. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, thanks for coming and talking to us, uh, Daniel. Hey, thank you. You have a good night. Yeah, you too. We'll uh, wrap this up and we'll have another one next week. All right. I really enjoyed being on. Nice talking to you again. Yeah, you too. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit